Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life. Well, we are 23 hours and 11 minutes into the 24th day of October, and we're beginning our uh, verbal essay. Uh, tonight's title is uh, Rhetoric and Ver Rhetoric and Reality. Uh, these are two things that are often get very, very mixed up and confused. Uh, rhetoric is the advertisement. There's an ideology. Ugh. And you want to sell that ideology. Well, the rhetoric is what you use to sell the ideology. But the rhetoric, your sales pitch, is often fundamentally different from reality. It never really things never really pan out to be exactly what you expect them to be. And this is could be said to be true for anything. Uh, we use Lionel as an example because Lionel is in an indep independent. He's on neither side, but he feels free to choose from either side as well. So he does he he's, he doesn't feel restricted by categories, and this is what makes him such a great observation. If you want to if you want to study behavior of a particular situation or a particular environment, you have to pick something that stand, kind of anyway stands out and gives you the reference point. Uh, that you can contrast against with other, let's say, standard perspectives. So, how do you how do you reference? How do you observe Alex Jones in this particular environment? What you do is you look at Lionel LeBron. You compare Lionel LeBron's work and uh, to Alex Jones. Uh, the same thing. You listen to uh, the, uh, uh, the New Turks. You watch you watch their stuff and compare it to what Lionel does. In that in that in that capacity, you'll be able to sort of divine and sort of get a standard as, as to where people are. And it, first, you have to get an idea where, where Lionel is coming from when he talks about he is a classic liberal. And he's referring back to the days of of basically modernist, uh, modernist liberal who was open-minded about things. That's all, meant, that's all liberal actually meant was to be open-minded. Uh, it goes back to the French as the laissez-faire uh, uh, capitalism, but the, that whole laissez-faire stuff, the, 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 the reference back to France is a reference back to Voltaire. Voltaire really sort of became the uh, poster boy for that particular movement. Uh, but as I said before, I go back and look at Voltaire and see what he's done in comparison to people like Newton, Newton and Leibniz. And you begin to realize that Newton, uh, that uh, all Voltaire did was simply rephrase, <laughs> reimagine uh, the work of Einstein, Leibniz, and uh, Descartes, uh, and create his what he calls his own ice sense of ideas, and ideals. And when you look at how they came up, because they, they it, it's from him, it's from the Voltaire group that he uh, that you have the oh, the reformers coming up. Uh, but the thing is, is, again, there is more to understand here. There's, we're only talking about the surface right now because you can only talk about the surface of that in, in, in half-hour segments. There is a lot more to do. This is where a lot of studying. And I guess it's not in terms of doing, oh, I'll do X amount a day and you'll be done within a week. No, this is going to take months and years. Uh, my dad just did a talk uh, on iconography. Yeah, art images, if you will, uh, for those who, uh, again, there's a service view and then there's beyond. Uh, it took him six months to do the work. <laughs> six months to put together a talk that lasted for maybe an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. It took a month to do it. There's a lot more to talk about. The, the, the lecture was simply the introduction. It's the surface. And this, unfortunately, well, a lot of people who are who are coined conspiracy theorists. And unfortunately, Lionel puts himself in this category because, again, he, there are certain things where he does not go into depth uh, and he makes these mistakes. And I'll illustrate this later on. But a conspiracy theorist uh, only sees the surface. They, 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 see the, they see the iceberg, the visible part of the iceberg, but they don't see below. They don't see the danger that's below. 
uh, they take assumptions from there. And so they all shout an alarm, iceberg, iceberg, almost like Chicken Little, but uh, there's not really much more to say about it because the rest is hidden, that's beneath it, it's not really seen, and they can't make sense of what they're actually seeing. So they sort of try to put these uh, ideas that they have together to some degree of conclusion, but these conclusions are often wrong or in many cases misleading <sighs> because they're missing key factors that, that well, basically are, are not within their experience. I mean, people are talking about the, the various different drugs for, for, for uh, uh, that doctors will use or in, in, the, in the past did use. Because right now, doctors are simply following a prescription. They're not doing their own work. Uh, and so there is a board above them telling them which drug they can and can't use. Uh, in the previous era of, of medicine, uh, doctors were diagnosticians. They were there to resolve problems within the body. And they had to sort of figure their way out through the whole situation. And the thing is, you can't just simply give a person a drug and, oh, there you go, problem solved. Uh, because what happens is that you don't know how the person is going to react to the drug, because, particularly if there's other medications involved, and if we're dealing with the other, because all these different medications can interact with each other in a very negative manner. So you want to be careful of what you do. So you do something in chemistry, which is known as titration. You take small amounts, small doses, and introduce it, look for negative effect. Increase the dosage if you're not at the dose, dose that you think is necessary. So you, you examine the patient to see on, on if they've been, let's say, two weeks on that drug, after two weeks on that le- drug and at that level you're introducing them to. If they do all right but need, seem to need more, then you increase it again a little bit. Not, not, not a lot. Titration is baby steps, small steps. And they're incremental steps to get you to the point where you need to be. But you're watching, you're being very careful to make sure that the patient doesn't react negatively to this particular uh, a drug. And this is one of the things that sort of pops up, with, particularly with some of, some of the elderly, is that on certain blood thinners, you can end up with excess bleeding. A bleeding that is not good for the person, but the, the, the doctor, uh, it may not be the medicine directly, but it may, may be a combination sort of thing where you're having a side effect that the the Normally, your, your blood thinner wouldn't react to, but now is in this situation where it was introduced to a new uh, chemical, a new drug, and now it's interacting in a way, but this ma- this sort of interaction may never have been recorded before, so it's something new you're seeing. So how do you, in a situation where you're, where you're seeing something new, how do you resolve this particular issue, particularly if there's no other literature, there's no other background reference uh, to deal with? And this is it. In science, Background reference, what your background re- reference is, and how you get it is an extremely important thing. Same thing with observation out here. There is background research that, ha- research that has to be done. There is background uh, 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 testing that needs to be done so that you have a standard, you have something to compare it to. And this is what we do with Lionel. Lionel is our background, uh, our background check. He's part of our background source. So we can have an idea, a reference as to what to look for in other areas, uh, and so we can compare, take, say, you know, Young Turks and compare him, compare Young Turks to Lionel. You know, watch what what's Young Turks saying compared to what Lionel says. Uh, watch it for a period of time, see who is right and who is wrong. And wh- I did this for more than a year. I watched uh, 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 Young Turks versus Lionel. Uh, I I'd do the Young Turks, and then I'd w- look at Lionel, uh, and then sometime in in, in reverse. Uh, over a year and realized the young Turks were simply spinning their wheels. I mean, what were they doing? They acted as parents. They simply repeated the party line. They never questioned anything. Where Trump was, you, where, where not Trump, uh, Lionel was really struggling with his decisions as to who he wanted. Initially, he wasn't for anybody. Uh, he was a Democrat who has become, became disenchanted with Hillary Clinton, uh, but didn't know who he wanted. He thought that the, the, the whole election for 2016 would be rigged and that Clinton would win because that, that's what she did to Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was screwed out of the uh, primary uh, way back when in 2016 because 
Hillary Clinton had cheated. And it was very clear that she had cheated. But the Democrats, the powers that be, and the Democrats said, no, you're going to go with the Hillary Clinton. And everyone else shut up, and inclu including uh, Bernie Sanders, who rolled over and gave Clinton whatever he want, whatever she wanted. And I think as we saw the same thing again in the 2000s, like we saw the, you know, it, everyone thought that was Bernie's time to shine. Well, nope. Bernie, you're going to step aside and you're going to let um, uh, Joe Biden take the, take, the, take the lead for now. And uh, that's what they did. Everyone sort of knuckled down and, they, and here, come, here comes along uh, uh, Mr. Joe Biden and Joe Biden, uh, uh, creepy Uncle Joe, as they call him, became president of the United States. And of course, they chose the first black woman for, for vice president. And that was, uh, that was uh, <laughs> Camilla Harris. Who really wasn't black? Uh, she's Indian, and Indian, Indians do have darker skins. But because there's a long history of uh, of the Hellenic Empire within India, uh, there is a number of the gradation of skin that you will find in India goes all the way from dark, from the dark, and it's typically near the south, all the way up to the north, where you have the Himalayas, and you have uh, well, the, the Buddhists up in, Hindu, in, 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 in in the Himalayas were actually Hindu. This is this Buddha Buddha himself was was a Hindu. He wasn't uh, his own religion as it is now. Uh, so, and history has these weird bumps and curves uh, that you have to look into. But this was this is uh, you know Camilla Harris. You know, but this is the nature of politics, politics again. It's not about the issue. It's about who puts on the best show. And there was a good show between. Uh, Trump and Biden, but the thing is, is that uh, uh, they were able to convince enough people to, to go with Biden. Uh, not saying that it was done fair and square, but uh, I would say the numbers would be split down fifty-fifty, and so the fact that Biden won was basically a, a toss of the coin. This is what happened with George W. Bush. How did George W. Bush win in, in, in back, way back when? In 2000, he won by a flip of a coin. There is a point in statistics where the numbers, and you talk about the measure, you talk about the accuracy, the error margins, and the 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 call the call the the, the, the points on either side was so close, you could have flipped a coin. It didn't matter about the numbers or, or recounts or whatever. Because you had an a state where, with the margin of error, it was so close that you were in call a statistical dead heat. So the whole thing came down to basically a flip of the coin. And it ended up that George Bush got, uh, George W. Bush got the, uh, the call right, and he ended up as president. So it wasn't a, a, a brilliant, brilliant stroke of genius that that, that uh, George W. Bush became president. It was more an issue that he won the toss of the coin, <laughs> how he became president. But of course, uh, the, the the Democrats didn't take that too well, and well, there was a lot of uh, unpleasantness uh, that it sort of cum culminated in in uh, well, basically nine eleven. And again, of course, there's a whole bunch of people who are running around doing examinations of the 9-11 issue. But the thing is, once again, you're dealing with with, with uh, rea uh, rhetoric versus reality. And there is one uh, a point of reference you can make for 9-11. And this has to do with uh, going back into history. This is Agatha, Agatha Christie's uh, Hercule Poirot, uh, the Belgium, or he, he detests the word French, is Belgium. Uh, he is, uh, he, uh, it's called Murder on the or Orient Express. And it's actually, it's actually a quite telling tale because and this is where rhetoric meets reality. He was a modernist. He ultimately believed in the infallibility of logic, human logic. And that things could be deduced with human logic and this was this is what uh, was uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes infallible logic yeah, deduction, and this is what he did. He did all, everything was done by deduction. 
So he went on to to the train. You know, there was the, 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 a friend had begged him to go on to sort of just you know look over the train, make sure things were secure. And on this train, there was a group of people. You know, seemingly individual on the train. And one of the people uh, ended up being murdered. And so now this is here. This is his time to shine. What do you do? You look for uh, means and motive. And he examined everybody, you know, he examined everybody, found different suspects as he typically did. He brings them all into a room and tries to start to figure out you're the one who did it. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't figure out because uh, he found out almost everybody on the train had a means and a motive. The mo had the motive and the means to kill the person who was killed. So they finally did stop the train. It was, it was in this tunnel that stopped the train. And they go to have this conference because everyone's now taken off the train. And uh, somebody's loud sound system in the car. And they go have a conference to find out who was the killer. And he's, you know, Perot is stumped. You can't figure out who the killer is. Well, it turns out that everybody on the train who had the motive to kill, to kill this guy killed him. They were, they were all involved in the murder. They were all involved in the cover-up of this particular murder. So it wasn't one person. Or it, was all the, it was all of the above. It's a, here's, your, here's, your, here's your last. You have five people who are suspects. And the logic will tell you that only one of the, subs, uh, only one of the suspects can be guilty. Well, this is the case where instead of having A, B, C, A, B, C, D, or E, right, or R, E, it wasn't A, B, C, D, or E. It was all of them. In other words, it was all of the above. And the thing is, 9-11, if you look, sit down, do that sort of mystery thing, you begin to realize there were a lot of different players in there. A lot of these different people had motive and they had means to do it. To pull off 9 11. So, this was a, in many cases a conspiracy. This was, it, because these people were working together to achieve a particular goal. Now, now I say, oh, yes, this thing is scripted. Well, no. Conspiracies don't have to be conscripted. Again, if you understand human psychology, particularly group psychology, you can create an incident by doing absolutely nothing. And this is what's happened with 9-11. 9-11 was a, an incident where nothing was done. And this is why it was so difficult to say, well, well you did it. It has to be an inside job. And, and everybody's working together. Well, no. It's because enough people, enough people, in many cases, did their job but not do an extra job and checking extra. That this is what occurs. And then this is the, the, this is what they have with the, uh, 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 Pearl Harbor. Go back to Pearl Harbor. What happened to Pearl Harbor? Well, it looks in their file. They found in their file. They found the uh, uh, the graph produced by the radar that showed the incoming planes. This was before Pearl Harbor, before the planes hit the harbor. They were spotted on radar. But some of them, Clark, because everyone was out on Sunday. Everyone was out. No, no one wanted to sort of stay over the weekend. Simply misfiled, <laughs> misfiled the radar thing. It was never forwarded to the appropriate command, and it just sort of sat on the shelf while Pearl Harbor was bombed. Now you can call that a conspiracy if you want to, and say, "Well, they should have known." But yeah, they should have known. But at the same time, you really can't put any blame on anybody because you don't have any evidence that that someone actually did something. You have a suspicion that somebody has done something. But again, it's just typically that the bureaucracy, this is the way bureaucracy works, it's misfiled something, the file didn't get to the right people, and 9-11, uh, and, and well, Pearl Harbor happened. It's the same thing with with uh, with 9-11, is that there, there were enough enough uh, indications that people just simply did their d daily job, didn't suspect anything of happening until afterwards, until after 9-11 then you start going back and say, well, who did what? Well, the thing is, everyone did their job. But this is the way bureaucracy works. Bureaucracy works to cover its own ass. This is the difference between reality and rhetoric. And what they did is that, that, that 
along the path of bureaucracy as these things were occurring, various different mistakes were made. And these were typical mistakes. These weren't anything spectacular. So you could say everyone was doing their job, but they didn't do enough to prevent 9-11, where they could have. But the thing is, a conspiracy, theory, the, a conspiracy theorist, and these are the ones that I've seen, never came to that conclusion because they considered that everybody was working together. And they aren't necessarily, they don't really work like that. This is the same, this is the same thing with so-called spying. Spying is not about, you know, James Bond or what you see in, in James Bond. Uh, spying is more about, in, in, in Intel, it's more about QLARP. It's, 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 it's a live action role play. It's what you see at Davos. Everyone that goes up and plays a part, has a bit, you read your role, and that's it. I mean, I remember when, when QAnon began. QAnon was started off as a bizarre little thing. The, the large chunk of the people who were, doing, who were, do, who were part of QAnon, uh, they were doing uh, numerology. They were trying to predict the future. They were use, using the Da Vinci Code. Never worked. It, it, every time you look at it, you it failed, it failed, it failed over and over again. They got some of the stuff right, but most of the time, uh, their predictions were wrong. Until you got some a group coming in there saying, oh, we got more stuff here. But the thing is, what had happened is you had people coming in, and I had caught them. I caught them. They were people from from uh, the uh, the Democrat side of things. And they were there as double agents. They came in as QAnons, there to lead, lead people aside, to get them angry, to get them to do things like, you know, J9, and this was a work. It became a work uh, it, it, because you had double agents within QAnon. Of course, this never comes out in the news and because most journals ha really don't do that much in terms of their in-depth. We're doing in-depth news. Well, no, you're not. More often than not, the news is simply the cover stories that are given to them, handed to them, much like you see in uh, Mary Tyler Moore. This is uh, Lionel's reference to the Ted Baxter news uh, or... or Sock puppet medias. Well, this is all re referring back to this uh, a TV show uh, in well, it's 1970, uh, and it was called Mary, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, and she was a news anchor. This was the first female news anchor in you know in the newsroom and stuff like. Not anchor. She was a re researcher. She was a producer, and she'd and she'd type up a, work on research and type up all the scripts for the anchor. The anchor was simple. The anchor. The one in front of the camera was simply reading a script. And nothing more. The work that that had done in terms of the actual research, the knowledge was done by somebody else. This guy was basically, the guy on the banker was basically a sock puppet. He didn't do anything. And his knowledge was, <laughs> his knowledge was, you know, on that same level that if he didn't have a script in front of him, he didn't know what to say. There was nothing for him to actually say or even talk about. He knew nothing, and this is sort of the Mary Tyler Moore thing. This this is where uh, uh, Lionel and the, the anchor's name was Ted Baxter, and this is where uh, Lionel gets his reference to reference as uh, the sock puppet or Ted Baxter news, and, and this is the way most news. Is. So, so a large chunk of the stuff is going to be missed by that is not going to be in the news because mostly uh, the researchers and the people in the news don't have the ability to do so, and this is why they're put there. The news is there to create the narrative. This is Edward Bernays. They're there to create the stage so that politics is entertaining. It's entertainment. And this is the, these are the scripts that they write. They're not in control of anything. And this is where you get uh, the difference between reality and rhetoric. And so you do, uh, people like myself and even Lionel go, go around and read other things. And Lionel last night was talking his his one on yesterday I think uh, I think it was Saturday or, or something like that. He's talking about how do you know you're talking to an idiot because they're talking. He goes, well, you're talking to an idiot because if they're mentioning communism or socialism, they're an idiot. Well, I tell you, honest, okay, okay. And that because it's best not coming from me. It's best coming from something else. So I was going through my my daily routine on RT and seeing what they had produced. Did they? It takes me about two, three hours to scroll through everything I need to scroll through uh, before I get to the end of uh, my uh, perusing of one particular news source or another. So 
uh, to do three or four different sources, I can spend the entire day doing it, uh, doing the proper sourcing for uh, a particular article. But this one was based on um, it was uh, a, a speech that Putin had just recently given. And what was the speech on? How what's going on in the United States now with cancel culture and all these other different things reminds him of the early days of the Soviet Union. That's how he's talking about communism. So here's the reference. I can say rhetoric or reality, or Lionel, Lionel of Lionel, my nation of LionelMedia.com calls Putin an idiot. Because remember, he says only idiots talk. Compare the situation to communism. Well, here's Putin comparing the situation to communism. So is Putin an idiot? We are. Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween and Middle School for Life.